Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. Yeah, I'm covering the label with my hand just so I can uh, be a little lazy about putting tape on it. This package here comes from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. There's no name on the outside, so hopefully there's a letter on the inside. Hi to all my viewers in Pennsylvania. That's a state on the east coast of the U.S. Well, not on the coast, but the eastern side of the country. And inside we have a little package here. It's a little squished, but um, so far so good. All right, here we go. Inside there's some cool packing here. And what do we have in here? What is this? Ah, okay, yes. Yes, I know what this is. All right, so looking at this thing, you can see here it says the MC68000 Free Run Tester Mercury Coating Rev A4-17. And we have a couple crystal oscillators here. There's a 16 megahertz and a 12 megahertz. And there are dip switches here to allow you to control what speed the processor is going to run at from 750 kilohertz all the way up to 16 megahertz. There's also a coax connection right here for an external clock if you want a clock that's at your own custom frequency. Let's look at the back, see if anything is written on here. There is not. And then there's this little adapter here which plugs into this zero insertion force socket and then it goes to the higher density version which i'm not totally sure are there versions of the 68000 that are dip that are the high density pins this is similar to the pla footprint in the slim 64 64c's the later machines the early bread bins obviously use a regular dip but later commodore integrated all of that into a, a much larger pla which i think uses this higher density socket Maybe 68,000s also come in that larger format uh, than the usual dip format, which is what I always see on the Amiga, Macintoshes, and stuff like that. From my understanding, the use of this is essentially you can pop your processor in there, and it's going to do the equivalent of like a no-op instruction on the 6502. When you lock the data bus of a 6502 with the no-op instruction, what happens is the processor just runs through the entire address space. So if you have LEDs that show you your address lines, you'll just see it basically counting all the way through all the address lines over and over and over again forever. This board here has A1 through A23, which is interesting. I thought the 68000 had 24 address lines. So it would be A0 through A23. We have a couple buttons here for reset and halt, and then this is a power switch. And then this is obviously for power, 24-pin ATX power connector, which is a little unusual in my opinion because uh, you just need 5 volts. Test one of these, you don't need a lot of current. USB would maybe be easier. All right, I finally found the email on this thing, um, and it was not a patron, obviously. It was just uh, in my inbox. And here is a blog post with more information on the tester. So let's just check this out quickly. It's a project from 2017, hence the April 17th date right there. I'm actually not sure of the user's name here, so I'm going to call it viewer. My viewer was trying to find CPUs for a project they were working on. And uh, obviously when you buy them from China or wherever, you just don't know if they're going to work properly. In fact, I have done that. I got to go find my 68,000s, but I know I have a little stack of them, which came from AliExpress, which I don't really know for sure if they work. So my viewer designed this little project here, which will free run the 68,000. And it will allow you to run it up to 16 megahertz, which is kind of cool if you say it's marked with a dash 16, but you're not even sure if it really is a 16 megahertz part. Maybe it's just an 8 megahertz part. So clearly running at 16 may cause it to lock up and you have to down, down rate it, right? And they rebadge them from China, you know, all that good stuff that happens. This project uses a frequency divider right here that allows it to get all these other intermediate frequencies. This is indeed a regular ATX power supply connector. Pico PSU is recommended. And I guess indeed there are 1.78 millimeter CPUs, which is what this adapter is for, as opposed to the 2.54, which is on here. And my viewer here is talking about future additions to the project. And one of them is USB power, because ATX can be eliminated. <laughs> also a couple of the signals over here, I think um, FC2 and FC0 are swapped. And there is a video of it operating. So let's just give this a quick play. So Pico ATX goes on, powers up. Looks like it's set for 750 kilohertz. And there it goes. So it's counting up. 
That's exactly what I said was going to happen is those, those address lines were just going to count and pushing the reset button just restarts it. All right, great. Well, let me go grab an ATX power supply and a processor and let's test this out. Let's move those there. I think I got some CPUs in here. Aha, here they are. These are the 68,000s I bought and I did have a check mark on there. So maybe I did test these. I would have had to put them in an Amiga or something to do that. So we have what's marked as a 6810 12 megahertz. We're not gonna be able to tell that apart from the 68,000. A 68,000 12 megahertz, another 68,000 12 megahertz, and an original Signetics eight megahertz part. So that's gonna be real. <laughs> These ones on the other hand, who knows? They actually worked. I put them in a computer, but they probably ran at eight megahertz. Pico ATX is in this box. It's the one I've shown on the channel a few times. For whatever reason, I have a Molex on here, but whatever. All right, the bench power supply is clipped in here. 12 volts, 500 milliamps. Turn that on. Okay, we got power and we got connected. All right, the power's off. It's currently set for 750 kilohertz. We're gonna put the actual Signetics chip in here first. And here we go. Look at that. Blinky, blinky lights. So even though you can't see it, you can rest assured that these LEDs over here are indeed actually blinking. They're just going so fast that they just look solidly on. It does appear that these LEDs over here, FC1 and well, what is FC2 is on because these are swapped, are lit, which I guess is normal. The reason why these are here is in case there's a problem and say they're on when they shouldn't be or whatever. We need to test that the halt works. I guess halt does work. Looks like it freezes everything, disconnects the CPU from the bus, and then it resumes. So if you look over here, this LED is on. When I push halt, it's off. And when I let go, it's back on again. So it continues execution. Reset, on the other hand, should start all the way from the beginning. There we go, it starts in the beginning. Cool, okay, so we know for sure this CPU works. Question is, how fast can it work? So it's rated for eight megahertz. Let's run it at eight megahertz. All right, the blinking's obviously happening a lot faster, way faster. Gets very quickly up to uh, top the top uh, address line there. Let's overclock. Here we go, 12 megahertz. It's going. It is going. Now, if this processor really couldn't handle 12 megahertz, I think it wouldn't even do this. Let's try 16 megahertz. Could this processor really run at twice its rated clock speed and not crash? I mean, it's interesting how fast it's really going just over here. That's it. Well, definitely color me impressed about the overclocking abilities. I mean, this is obviously not a comprehensive test. There may be other parts of the CPU that don't work properly at these higher speeds, but definitely whatever instruction is running now to cause it to free run like this does work. Wow. All right, how about the first of my rebadged, ugly looking processors here? Oops, that was the right way. Pop that in. Let's switch this back down to eight megahertz which surely would have been the speed I tested this at originally. All right, all looks good. Halt works. Reset works. Speed this up a little bit. Let's go right to 16 megahertz. It's running as well. Now, I really think this is a real 68,000 chip. And what happened is, you know, it might've been something like this Signetics one here, and they didn't want to have this non-Motorola branding. It's just easier for them to sell if they're all branded the same. So they just sand that off, laser etch on the new Motorola badge, but they put 12 megahertz on here. And that's the problem is that whatever the original speed is gone, not to mention, you know, could this actually be a 68010? Uh, Who knows, right? They would have scraped that off and put on the new etching but it does run at this uh, faster clock speed. Now, interesting that the LEDs, they're pretty bright. Let me see if they seem almost brighter than with this other chip on here. Yeah, like, I don't know if that's coming across in the camera, but those LEDs are definitely dimmer with this processor than, without, than with that one. Here's another 12 megahertz part. Let's see what that run does at 16 megahertz. It works as well. This is amazing. 
So I guess the idea would be to run them in this thing and leave them running for a long period of time. Say, set it to the clock speed that I desire, not 750 kilohertz, and, um, you know, let it run and make sure it doesn't freeze up. Because if it freezes, clearly there's at least some kind of a fault in here. But also we can check to make sure that all the address lines are working by all the LEDs lighting up. Like if you have ones that are missing, then we know that those driver lines are bad. Same for these LEDs over here. All right, and the final one is the 68010, the slight upgrade to the processor. It says it's 12 megahertz part. Let's, uh, well, first we'll run it at 750. Interesting how it initializes with all the lights on there. Do you see that? Oh, it didn't do it that time. All right, well, anyways, everything seems to be operating normally. Let's ramp the speed up to uh, 12 megahertz. Gotta say, these LEDs are really, really bright. They don't appear to have any dropper resistors of any kind. They're just connected directly between the, uh, the lines here and the five volt rail. That doesn't seem, that doesn't seem really good. Huh, that definitely seems to be overdriving those LEDs a little bit. So now that I know the LEDs have no dropper resistors, I'm a little hesitant to use this. My thought of leaving it running for hours and hours and hours it can't be good because if uh, one of these LEDs shorts, well, that's gonna short the output of the CPU, the address line directly to the ground line. So not really good. So for a quick test to make sure the processor is not dead totally, this is gonna be fine, I guess. The LEDs don't seem to die completely, but ultimately they're definitely being overdriven quite a bit. Looks like the power LEDs here have dropper resistors. So ideally, um, that should have been installed on these as well. It wouldn't have been that hard either to just use some resistor packs. Would have just been, uh, what, like two or three of those resistor packs to give these things like a 460 ohm drop. So that is a cool tester. Thank you very much to my viewer who sent these in, Mercury Testing. I'll put a link to the blog about these. If you can buy these or not, I am not sure. I don't know if this is an open source project like is available on GitHub to modify or, or make yourself. Um, but I don't think it would be that difficult to do anyways, right? Because uh, you just need to wire up the data bus lines in a very specific way. There's no special components on here to do that. So I don't think it would be too hard if you were gonna replicate one of these yourself and you just have to buy these zero insertion force sockets. You can get those from various sources, eBay, AliExpress, et cetera, et cetera. So anyhow, there we go. If you liked this video, thumbs up would be appreciated. Definitely subscribe to my second channel if you haven't already. Thanks to my patrons, their names are scrolling up the side of the screen right now. If you want to become a patron yourself, there is a link in the description below. Love to hear your comments and your thoughts on this video. And I guess that is going to be it. So stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you all next time. Bye.